Welcome to Gears Action Growth, shifting business culture one conversation at a time. My name is Christine Mori, and I'm joining Dr. Josephine Palermo, whose superpower is to create business cultures that transform organizations team by team. Today, we're on the topic of resilience. Hey, Joe, how's your week so far? Oh, I'm good, Christy. Really good. Great, great to be here. Yeah, it's, it helps now that it's a bit warmer. Do you like colder weather or? I love summer. So the okay. spring just makes me so happy and it's, nice. it's, it's beautiful. And I think it's, um, it, it helps you to just feel a sense of hope because everything's growing or starting to bloom. I'm really getting into all the cherry blossoms at the moment. Oh, just I was actually going to mention cherry blossoms. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, in Japan, when I used to live there, they actually had cherry blossom viewings. Um, so it's a huge celebration for mm. three weeks. And they're known as symbols of resilience. There you go. Yeah, because it takes them like the whole year to bloom. And then they bloom for three weeks and then they start all over again. Right. So that's like 12 months, almost, no, almost 12 months. Yeah, I yeah. love that. That's fantastic. Yeah, so cherry blossoms, symbol of mm. resilience. So mm. that's perfect. Today yeah. we're going to dive into a few topics regarding resilience. So we'll talk about what resilience is, why some people are more resilient than others, and resilience in your business and why it's important and practical ways individuals and even organizations can become more resilient. So before we get into what resilience is, uh, we were thinking about this topic because we kept on hearing phrases that sounded... Uh, along the lines of I'm so sick of this I can't wait till this is over and obviously we're in a global pandemic so Joe when you heard these kinds of repeated same patterns of thought what did you think well I think that people right now are um, challenged and and what COVID uh, uh, and what the pandemic is doing to us personally is really challenging us a lot um, around the resources that we have to cope uh, and and adapt to change. And for many of us, I think when all of this first started, we had no idea that you know six months down the track we would still be facing lockdowns. We would still be you know focused on um, numbers that that the the world would be still impacted. And so. So what happens is that there's, you know, there's been a good deal of fear and worry and anxiety because there's so much uncertainty um, surrounding the impacts of the pandemic. And all that uncertainty does tax us. It does because it relies on us to continue to um, demonstrate and rely on our own coping strategies. And we, there's a, you know, we're almost like a glass of water you know once you drink that water you either have to fill it up again um, if you're thirsty and so that's what kind of coping strategies are like we have a, a level of sort of personal resource around our coping but the more that's taxed and the more we're challenged the harder that gets and then we have to fill up our cup again and um, and I think for some people that's getting harder and harder um, as as the impacts of COVID-19 get longer and longer. So what is resilience in general? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, resilience is actually a process. Um, it's, it can be an individual quality and, and it can be a quality of an organisation, but it's literally uh, it, uh, the process of bouncing back and recovering after experiencing a negative event or an unexpected event. And in fact, resilience, the word is, is based on the Latin word called, um, called resilio, which actually means rebound or bounce back. So it, it really involves a three-step process where it's our ability to kind of anticipate unexpected events. And then secondly, to cope and adapt to those in a positive way rather than a negative way and then it's our ability to recover so so it's the it's our ability to put all of those processes together when we need them mm. and why do you think this is such an important trait to build up in all of our lives well i think basically in our life um we live a long time you know people keep saying life is short but i actually think we're living longer and longer so it's, we live a long time and we will always face 
things that are unexpected. As much as we try to control our environment and control uh, the things around us, there are always surprises. Some of them are really great surprises, but some of those surprises really knock us out. We're not expecting them. They're challenges. They can cause a lot of stress in our personal or or even in, from a kind of business perspective in our in our business life. So so it you know we can have the best laid plans, but then there are certain conditions in our environment or with the people around us that can really change those plans in a heartbeat. And so. All we can do is build our ability to cope with the uncertainty because we know that uncertainty is always going to be a contrast. And for me, actually, Christy, I have a bit of a philosophy of life on this. I actually think that kind of the bad things that happen to us, I see them as contrast. So for me, um, I really believe you can't be truly happy uh, if you haven't experienced something that perhaps makes you sad. It's it's sort of that yin and yang for me. And in particular, contrast and the things that happen to us that kind of are unexpected or uncertain often really just cement for us what we do want, you know, where we do want to go if we're able to change and adapt and recover. So that's why resilience is important. It kind of, it's the thing in between us reacting to something negative and then getting something positive or constructive out of it yeah that reminds me of um, fairy tales and good and bad Mm. without the evil we don't actually get so involved into cheering on our hero isn't it yes yes yeah that's right and and we find that um that's why particularly for children and uh you know um a lot of um learning development and educational development um, researchers and psychologists have found that a lot of the experiences that we have as children where perhaps we we fail or we fall over or we um, you know perhaps don't get what we want and therefore we cry and get upset all of those experiences build up our resilience and um, and and they're important so it's important to allow people you know, particularly children, to experience some of that contrast in their life as well and not to shield them from that too much. Yeah, that sort of leads me into the next question is why do you think that some people are more resilient than others? So maybe Mm. it's childhood, maybe it's upbringing, environment. Yeah, and all of those things. So so we do have sort of individual differences as well. Um, And, you know, it's that nurture, nature-nurture debate on those. There are some some people who are who have a you know you, you often see the differences in babies around temperament there are slight differences in temperament and so some some of us are kind of you know in some ways born that way but maybe also the the conditions or the socialization that we experience as children reinforce that particular trait but there are some individual differences um, people that are more resilient tend to have a greater positive effect or mood. In other words, they tend they tend to be more optimistic. Um, they experience more positive emotions than negative emotions. And you might say, well, well, is that because you know their environment is more happy around them? It's not. It's actually that they the way they process information from their environment leads them to experience more positive mood because they're interpreting you know, whatever happens to them in a different way to someone who maybe has a kind of a a more preference or or is more geared towards negative affect. And so so that tends to be a a real protective factor against stress and burnout too. It's our ability to sort of, I guess, see the light at the end of the tunnel and still be hopeful even when bad things happen to us. Another individual factor is um, what we call self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is our belief in our own abilities to kind of solve problems and meet the challenges ahead. So, so even though, um, even though you know, two people might face the same problem, the person who has higher self-efficacy is more likely to cope with that unexpected event in a more constructive way, just because they know they can, or they believe that they can. So they're going to be more persistent in problem solving. They're going to be more um, likely to look for strategies that are more adaptive or help them to adapt in a more constructive way rather than 
um, maladaptive strategies. Um, maladaptive strategies are the things that we do sometimes to cope that maybe aren't as good for us. And, you know, some people turn to substances, some people turn to just reacting in a, in a way that, um, that reinforces certain um, self-talk in their heads about, um, you know, and, and maintain the, like the energy around that feeling or the intensity around that feeling. So, so self-efficacy and positive effect are very much those individual differences. But, but you mentioned the environment, Christy, and that plays a really big uh, um, part in the way that we are able to bounce back, you know, be, be able to be resilient. And, and, you know, you'd be surprised to learn that, you know, in a lot of studies where we've looked at, where researchers have looked at, uh, you know, who are the most resilient group of people, you know, across nations in the world. And you would be surprised to learn that it's actually refugees that are often the most resilient people on the planet. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychologist. Did you study him in your PhD? Yes, yes, I did. But remind, no, not in my PhD. Remind me about what you're you're thinking about there. Yeah, in terms of just uh, refugees being the most resilient people, mm, because Viktor mm. Frankl was also uh, in an internment camp through yes. in the Nazi regime, and yeah. he came out of it with a whole new perspective for his. Um, practice mm, in mm. psychology which is having hope and being optimistic is how why some people survived really yes yeah exactly so that can was you a... recommend maybe one thing that we can all do to be more in this optimistic perspective yes yeah i can and this can be something that uh businesses can do as well as individuals what's really important is our social connections so we know that when people are, when they feel like they belong to a social kind of group, uh, it can be it can be people they know, or even if it's a, a group that they identify with, it could, uh, that that is you know maybe following the same cause as them. That sense of belonging and social cohesion really makes a difference to to resilience, and that can be um, you know ensuring that people have strong family ties or that there's a community response when something happens and people feel like they're not alone um, in, a, in a company or organisation. It could be, you know, looking at how are employees just connecting on a social level? Uh, are we um, making them feel like they belong and that, that there is some social support there for them? That makes a huge difference in terms of people's ability to see that uh, see that situation from a more optimistic light and also feel like they can um, you know sort of have a range of people that can they can um, they can go to for support as well so having just and it's not having people around you it's having really sort of strong ties with those people like quality so quality, quality ties exactly that's mm. right yeah so yeah. in terms of uh, business and work culture, can you share a scenario or some scenarios where you needed resilience as an individual or in a team? Yeah, I, I think for me, there's actually been a few, but the one that stands out the most and is where I actually had to go through something that I really didn't want to do. In, and what I, I was doing was I was new to a team in an org a large corporate organization, and I had to uh, restructure the team and therefore make some of my team redundant. So I was leading about twenty seven people at the time, and we were reducing staff by about forty percent. So I knew that uh, the team, you know that within my team forty percent of them would need to be made redundant. They were, you know, they. I communicated this to them. I was very transparent. Um, and the way we did it is we sort of opened up all the roles and people had to go for their, for a role to sort of, um, you know, be successful. And the ones that weren't successful in that process would then be given, um, you know, redundancy packages. So, so not only were we making people redundant, but we were getting them to compete for the same jobs too. So you can imagine, and this team, 
um, it wasn't their first restructure either. I think by the time I got there, they had already faced three other restructures. So they were, you know, so tired of it. There was a lot of change fatigue um, and they were feeling dejected and demoralised. And, you know, some of these team members had been with the company for over 15 years. So they couldn't even imagine a life outside the company. So they were feeling really worried and anxious about it. So what I did was I made a really firm decision as a leader that I was going to just commit myself to helping them increase their resilience through this process and um, and help them get through that, that time. And what I wanted to do, I focused on building their self-efficacy. I wanted to um, build their self-efficacy so that whether they stayed or were, you know, forced to go, they would be feeling buoyant and confident and able to face that challenge. And so what I did was I firstly, I communicated my commitment to them and I was very strong in that. I said, my one number one priority is to ensure that you all end up in a place where you want to be and you're feeling confident about it. And they all looked at me like I was crazy because they weren't feeling confident and they weren't feeling optimistic. But I, all I could do was actually say to them, you know, this is what I'm committed to doing. And then what I did was I introduced the concept of pitch decks and, um, and I asked them all to, to develop a pitch deck. Now, what a pitch deck is, it's actually used by entrepreneurs when they're seeking funding from investors and uh, it's like a, you know, it's like a PowerPoint pack or a PDF or, you know, a set of documents that helps them really talk about the strengths of themselves and their business. And, you know, it kind of it shows an investor why that investor should invest in them. So it's very geared towards a strengths based approach. And it's also very creative. You use a lot of pictures to describe concepts. It's not a lot of words. So First, what I firstly what I did is I developed a, a bit of a workshop with them and I took them through, you know, this is how you develop a pitch deck and this is how you might do it for yourself because you can develop a pitch deck which basically promotes you as a person and really focuses on the skills and competencies and capabilities you have as a worker. Um, and what I encouraged them to do was uh, to develop that so that they could either use that in the selection process for going into the new sort of job role and or a selection process for anywhere else they wanted to go because it might be outside you know the organization and on top of that what I did was every week at our team meetings we would review each other's pitch decks and and I got the team to help each other because I was really wanting to um, put something in place to to address the competition that they felt uh, between each other, because this that doesn't that does does nothing for team cohesion when all you have in the group is competition. I wanted to add a level of collaboration, so they reviewed each other's pitch decks. They gave each other constructive feedback. We learnt a lot about each other's strengths in the lead up to that restructure as well, and I could see the teams the teams' confidence growing and growing every week because they were focused on their own strengths on the positive ways in which they had contributed in the past and how they would contribute in the future. So rather than thinking about the the, the, the the change ahead as being something scary and where they didn't have control, what it did is it gave them control in terms of developing their own self-efficacy or their ability to, um, you know, kind of break through um, the the sort of change that they needed to to go to and you know I would hear them say things like um you know I I, I forgot about all the things that I've done here or you know I look at this I've, I actually feel really proud of what the work that I've done here so it started to remind them that they are valued and we were recognizing their skills so it really created that sense of optimism for the future and and in the end the outcome for that team was that yes, um, some of them did face redundancy, but all 27 of them were um, really comfortable and and happy to the point that you, as you can be happy when you're facing uncertainty with the change because even the ones that faced redundancy, because they'd gone through that pitch deck, they realised that staying in the organization probably wasn't a good thing for them. So I think I only had to make a choice 
um, between two people once because everyone else almost self-selected. They they either went for the job or they they selected to sort of put their hand up and say, look, it's time for me to go. And I feel I feel good about going because I know I can I can survive and manage and recover because I've, you know, I've got all these skills under my belt. Um, and even the, the ones that competed for the jobs, all of those won those jobs over other team members in other teams who didn't have pitch decks because they were the only ones with a pitch deck. So their application absolutely stood out, particularly the ones that went for leadership positions. So I was really proud of that because their engagement remained high, even though they were being made redundant or facing the possibility of redundancy. And for me, it was, um, as a leader, it was probably the best decision I made to invest in them through that process. This is such a positive story, Joe. Mm. Yeah. So for listeners that are in the situation of redundancy or getting let go at this moment, and they don't have someone like you who cares for them, <laughs> you know, is there yeah. one or two things that they can do in terms of building their own resilience in that scenario where they're facing job loss? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people are facing facing that right now. I think that focusing on your own strengths is important, but sometimes it's hard uh, to do that unless you have someone like me who's encouraging you. It doesn't have to be your boss who does that. It can be someone in your family. It can be someone in your social network that you trust and um, appreciate. It can be a mentor that you don't even know yet. So there are lots of mentor programs out there that you can um, connect with, where you can connect with other people. And there are also other networking programs. So so going outside your own network can be um, sometimes the, the solution for some people. But I think it's buddying up with someone who can help you identify your strengths is really important because that will raise your, your self-efficacy. And then the other thing that they can absolutely do is remind themselves of the relationships that they have around them, family, friends, and just spend some time with those people, having some quality time with those people, because that also takes us into a perspective of understanding that, you know, although work is really important, there are other things in our lives that are also equally important. Um, so I think those two things can can really help. Um, if anyone wants to develop a pitch deck, I'm really happy to put a link at the bottom of the of, of this podcast to some um, example pitch decks that they can then look at and then develop a pitch deck on their own as well. Yeah, that's great. And for anyone listening, um, Josephine also can help you personally with a mentorship program that she does through Business Elevator. And we'll add details for that as well. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we're looking forward to connecting with you next time. Please send us any questions and what you might want to hear more of in these series at Josephine at geared4growth.biz, which is in the description also below. And we'll chat with you next time. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.